Okay, thank you very much to Geraldine. Um, thank you, Tara Lee. Uh, thank you, Brain Restoration. Uh, very exciting stuff, and I'm, I'm really excited to see how the electrophysiology and the biochemistry go together. So let me just ask, how many people here want to avoid Alzheimer's? <laughs> so, yeah, me too, all right? And how many people here know you're fasting insulin? Okay, a few people, okay, some, okay. How many people know your APOE status? Okay, great, yeah, a number of people here. All right, uh, and how many people here know your HHV6A status? Okay, uh, and how, how many people here uh, know their nocturnal oximetry? Okay, not too many. So, you know, these are actually critical tests that doctors don't tend to do, except Dr. Brosfield, uh, and people who are really tuned in now to what it takes for your brain to function normally and to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And so we've got a huge issue now where the doctors aren't doing the tests, and of course we have a country where Alzheimer's has now become the third leading cause of death. So this is a huge and growing problem. As you know, it's set to bankrupt Medicare. Uh, in about next 10 to 15 years. So we really need to look at how this works. And so I ran a laboratory, a molecular neuroscience lab, for 30 years, and the whole idea was very simple. We wanted to understand the basic molecules that drove the process of neurodegeneration so that we could begin to, fun to, to fashion the first effective treatments. Because, as you know, this has been the area of greatest biomedical failure. As they say, everybody knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. So let me show you some of the first ones today. So as you know, it's a really sad state of affairs with Alzheimer's because everybody keeps telling us there's nothing you can do. So what do people do? They wait. Just the opposite of what we should do. We, by, by the way, what we're seeing is that everything is kind of upside down. And one of the things is that people wait because they say, yeah, my doctor can't do anything for me, so I just want to wait as long as I can. I don't want to be told if I have it. I know that you can't give me a medicine. The medicines aren't going to help. So unfortunately, people wait to come in when they should be doing the opposite. They should be coming in either per, for prevention or for early reversal. And that's when we see the best and the, and the clearest cut results repeatedly. Now finally, people then come in, they go to their primary care provider, and what does the primary care provider say? Well, um, I can write a prescription for Aricept just as well as a neurologist, so I don't need to refer you to anyone. And then finally, they keep getting worse and worse, and they say, you know, we better send you to an expert. And here's what the expert says. The expert says, number one, I can't help you. Number two, I'm going to make sure that, you, that I take away your driver's license. Number three, I'm going to make sure you can't get long-term care insurance, because once the doctor writes in your chart, pre-Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's or memory problems, you cannot get long-term care insurance. And then they say, well, look, I can't help you, but could you come back every six months for a spinal tap so I can renew my grant? That's how bad things are today. So we need to change that. We need to understand this disease so that we can begin to change how we look at it. There's, there's this feeling that there's absolutely nothing that can be done, and the experts keep telling us this. So let me show you uh, an evaluation. This is actually from one of the most outstanding centers in the United States. I won't say which one. It's, it's not on the West Coast. Um, they have many, many millions of dollars of grants, and this is from a relatively well-known Alzheimer's specialist who saw a patient uh, that had cognitive decline. So the guy says, okay, MRI of the brain and blood for complete blood count, metabolic panel, thyroid B12. I asked the patient and his wife to keep an eye on his disabilities to manage money, medications, and transportation. I prescribed the Nepazil, that's Aricept, five milligrams once per day. Here's what this person didn't do. Nothing on genetics. Didn't even ask if the person was APOE4 positive. There are multiple. There are about 35 genes that have some association with Alzheimer's, such as TREM2, CD33, NALP1. These are related to immune function and your response to the amyloid and the, and the insults that your brain is undergoing. Nothing about inflammation. Oh my gosh, we hear about neuroinflammation every day. This is a well-known Alzheimer's expert not even asking if this patient has any ongoing inflammation. 
Nothing about homocysteine or methylation, critical for a number of factors such as detoxification, such as vascular disease. Nothing on fasting insulin. We know that prediabetes and type 2 diabetes are highly associated, and metabolic syndrome, highly associated with cognitive decline and with risk for dementia. Nothing on hormonal status. Oh my gosh, this is again associated with Alzheimer's disease. Nothing on toxin status. We know that a number of toxins are associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. This wasn't even evaluated. This is a national center for Alzheimer's disease. Nothing on the innate immune system. When you make amyloid in your brain, which is what we associate with Alzheimer's disease, that is part of your innate immune system. You are literally making this to protect yourself against something. We want to know what that is. Wasn't even checked. Nothing on gut health. Every day we are hearing about the gut microbiome and its importance in Parkinson's and in Alzheimer's and in autism and on and on and on. Nothing about the status of the blood-brain barrier. There were no MRI volumetrics done, on and on and on. So again, people evaluate people with cognitive decline in a way be that because they know there's nothing that can be done. So there's not, you know, why, why bother to look because we can't do anything? Then, of course, this person was given Aricept without even a, a clear diagnosis. This guy happened to have a BMI of 33, so he was about 80 pounds overweight. Wasn't even mentioned. The, the feeling is that, that, the, you know, that the brain is separated from the body. You know, why check this? No plan to address it whatsoever. This guy had prediabetes, a key risk factor. Nothing even mentioned about addressing this. So this is, this is a typical 20th century evaluation of cognitive decline. And that has to change if we're going to be successful. If you look at the last decade, 244 clinical trials for drugs, 243 failed outright, and the one that succeeded has an absolutely minimal impact. And if you look, for example, in the middle top here, semigasostat. So semigasostat um, is, was developed by Lilly, um, over $500 million to develop this drug. Not only did it not make Alzheimer's better, it actually makes it worse. So it's worse than having water for Alzheimer's disease to take semigasostat. So what's wrong? Something's going wrong here when we're looking at this. Dimabon here in the upper left, it failed once, and they literally couldn't believe that it had failed. So they did the test again, and it failed again. So there's something fundamentally wrong with the way we're thinking about this disease, evaluating it and treating it when we're getting results like that. And when we have what we currently have in this country, which is about five and a half million people with Alzheimer's. And if you just take, you know, I have two daughters who are in their late 20s. So, okay, I want to know, are, are they going to get it? So we always are told five and a half million people. But the number we really want to know is out of the 323 million Americans currently living, how many of us are going to die from Alzheimer's? And the answer is about 45 million people. So it's a huge problem, and we need to address that going forward. So clearly, we need a paradigm shift. We need to change the way we think about this disease, the way we understand this disease, and the way we prevent it and treat it. So here's the fundamental problem, and this is from you know, from a neuroscience lab, if you kind of step back and take a big look here in a big picture, here is the problem with medicine. And I was taught standard 20th century medicine at Duke uh, way back in the late 70s. So when we dealt with diseases, here's what we did. We looked at what's actually causing the disease, and we were taught to make a diagnosis. So you say, okay, is this pneumococcal pneumonia, is this measles, is this a broken leg? It was all about what it is, getting that diagnosis. Now here's the problem. If someone develops pneumococcal pneumonia, yes, it's important, for example, if you have alcohol on board, you're more likely to get pneumococcal pneumonia. If you have diabetes mellitus, for example, you are more likely to get pneumococcal pneumonia. If your B cells, those are the ones that develop into the plasma cells that make your antibodies, so part of your immune system, 
If they are not working well, for example, if you have multiple myeloma, you are at increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. And you can go on and on. There are lots of these things that play a role. But as you can see there, far and away, the most important thing is the pneumococcus itself. So we as physicians could get away with giving you penicillin or amoxicillin or a, an antibiotic to treat that simple illness because one factor was so much more important than all other factors. Here's the problem. The diseases that we're all dying from now, which are complex chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, on and on. These are all fundamentally different than the diseases we were dying from 100 years ago, which were simple diseases. Now, when you look here, if you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, well, whether or not you have insulin resistance is really important. Whether or not you have specific pathogens, such as P. gingivalis from your mouth, T. denticola from your mouth, herpes simplex from your lip, specific molds from your sinuses. Whether or not these have invaded your brain, which they do, is really important, and we need to know that. Whether or not you have activation on, as of NF-kappa B, which is essentially saying, do you have ongoing inflammation? That's a mediator. If you have turned on your, <coughs> your NF-kappa B, you are more likely <clears throat> excuse me, to, um, to get Alzheimer's disease. If you have mercury, you are more likely, whether you've got it from your dental amalgams or whether you've got it from eating a lot of tuna fish. We had <clears throat> one guy a few years ago, early Alzheimer's disease, and I told him, you know, you've got type 3, as we'll get to the types in just a minute. Uh, you know, there's some toxin that you've got. We need to figure out what this is. He said, no, no, I, leave a, I lead a really clean life. Well, it turns out this guy had the highest mercury that the lab had seen in five years, massive amounts of mercury, because he had become an extremely successful businessman, and he decided he was going to have tuna sushi whenever he wanted to. And so he ended up giving himself early Alzheimer's. And guess what? When his mercury got better, he got much better. Mycotoxins, so specific toxins made by molds, which are often in our homes and we don't even recognize it. We get exposed to these for years. Organic toxins, things like uh, benzene, toluene, formaldehyde. Um, one of the patients we had from New York uh, had worked in a company that actually would burn paraffin candles 24-7 and developed Alzheimer's disease. And in her blood, the signature of paraffin candles with very high levels of toluene, formaldehyde, even mercury. So if you're going to be burning candles 24-7, please avoid paraffin uh, candles. Ah, thank you very much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Homocysteine, another thing very important to know. So as you can see, here's the big difference. No one of those things is off the top of the charts the way it is with pneumococcal pneumonia. So this is a fundamentally different type of disease. It has, it's a pathway, but it has many things that feed into that pathway. So for us to prevent it and reverse it, we need to identify the things that are causing a change in this pathway for each of us, and then we need to address as many as possible. So very different type of disease. <clears throat> so the current standard for Alzheimer's, if you go to a clinic today, is that there's one cause, and we don't know the cause. It's one disease. We call it Alzheimer's. And there's one treatment. It's a monotherapy. It's one drug, and it's ineffective. That's the problem. And telling someone they have Alzheimer's, like, well, why did I get this? Well, it's Alzheimer's. This is like taking your car into a mechanic because it's not working well, and the mechanic says, yeah, we know what this is. This is called car not working syndrome. <laughs> I mean, the, the term Alzheimer's just means you've got some amyloid in your brain and things are degenerating. It doesn't tell you what's causing it. So then you say to your mechanic, oh, well, aren't you going to check various things on my car to tell me why it's not functioning? Oh, we don't do those tests because they're not reimbursed. You know, that's the way, when you go to your doctor, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of duh in Alzheimer's disease. When we really look at it, the doctors aren't doing the things that are obviously the right things to do. 
Now, in the lab, what we found was very different than what's actually being done in the clinic. First of all, we found initially that there are 36 different contributors. We know of a few more now, but the bottom line is there are many things that lead to this same degenerative event. And in fact, therefore, we tell the people that come in, hey, it's like having a roof with 36 holes. A drug is a fantastic patch for one hole but it doesn't patch the other 35 holes. So in fact, we want to look to see what are all the things that are contributing to the decline. The second thing is when you begin to look at those, you see that there are groups. Some people tend to have more of an inflammatory type of Alzheimer's. Some people tend to have more of an atrophic type. Some have more of a toxic type. And of course, many people have a combination. Therefore, as you can imagine, there are many treatments and they are personalized. These are precision medicine that are targeted to the actual things that are causing the problem. So let me show you a few examples. Here's a woman, actually she's now 75. Um, this is a woman uh, that I described in the book um, as patient zero. Um, she works for the US government. She lives back on the East Coast. Um, she actually had gone in, and her doctor had written in the chart memory problems. Um, and she was unable to get long-term care insurance. She decided to commit suicide, um, called her friend to tell her about this, who lived in San Francisco, and said, why don't you come to the Buck Institute? So I hear they're doing something different there. Uh, now, at that point, I hadn't seen a patient in 20 years. Um, so I told her, look, if you're a mouse, I can do really well. We help the mice that have cognitive decline. Um, but uh, you know, we're not doing this with patients yet. We'd actually uh, applied to do the very first comprehensive trial in Alzheimer's, and we were turned down because they said, no, when you do clinical trials, it has to just be one variable. We said, yeah, but that's not the way the disease works. So this woman came in. I said, look, I'm happy to tell you what we're doing. Uh, her mother had died uh, with dementia, had started at 62. Um, this woman was unable to navigate on the freeway, places she'd been before. Um, couldn't remember what she'd read. She'd have to start at the top each time. And unable to prepare reports for her work. Couldn't even remember four-digit numbers. She does these uh, very detailed reports for the US government. <clears throat> Um, she had a retinal scan, which was positive for amyloid, and was actually positive, more positive than the positive control, which was a case of familial Alzheimer's disease. So I explained to her what we call recode, reversal of cognitive decline, and how the, we, she's going to have to address these various things. And frankly, I never thought, thought I would hear from her again. Um, again, we'd only treated mice at that point. This was now April of 2012 when I first saw her. So three months later, I got a call from her at my home on Saturday. And she said, I can't believe it. I'm back to work. My memory is better than it's been in 20 years. She is still doing really well. And so when she came to see me, I asked her, oops, I guess I'm supposed to go back to here. OK, so if you could play this. She talks a little bit about her story uh, here. So tell me a little bit about how things were a year ago. Well, a year ago, I was having a lot of difficulty. I was very frustrated because my memory was poor. Um, I had issues of being spatially disoriented, particularly when I was driving. I uh, would get off the freeway at the wrong exit or not know where I was getting back on, on familiar routes. Um, I would reach in my house for a light switch. I'd reach on the wrong wall, even though I'd always had the light switch has always been on, on the right side. I'd start reaching to the left. Um, I call my animals uh, a different name, uh, my pets, and I was really worried about it. I was very stressed about it, um, so it was, a, it was a very stressful time. And how are things at work? I have a, a job that requires a lot of mental uh, analysis, a lot of thinking. I, you know, I do a lot of research, I have to collect data, and design the study, and then do the analysis and write a report, usually under pressure. And I was finding that I just couldn't complete an assignment. I couldn't mm -hmm. think about the analysis. Um, it was just a jumble to me. And I would start procrastinating and putting it off. And the longer I put it off, the more stress I felt. So I was worried that I was not going to be able to continue with my career. And tell me a little bit about how things are now. Things are much improved now. Uh, my memory is much better. In fact. I would even go so far as to say I don't think that I have a problem uh, with memory now, uh, which is a great surprise to me from where I was a year ago. My, my thinking, uh, cognitive ability, ability to do work, ability to do reports, um, I am 
back into the stream of things, being productive and being able to do my analysis and writing, which is fantastic. And how's the driving? Driving, no problem. I drive at night, I drive in the daytime, um, I know where to get off, where to get on. Um, I'm uh, on, the, on the highway, so I'm, um, I feel like that's problem. I'm not reaching for the wrong side of the room for the light switch. I'm not calling my pets the wrong name, which I think they're probably grateful for. And how overall are you feeling? I feel great. I feel really, really good. I feel energetic. Uh, I feel more peaceful and calm about my life, but at the same time very enthusiastic. I've even started writing my book. Fantastic. A couple of chapters. Okay, thank you very much. So interestingly, she went off this overall protocol four different times. She ran out of some things. She was out of the country one time. She had a viral illness one time. Interestingly, each time, typically seven to 10 days after she would stop. She would start to decline again and get back on and, and go right back again. So here's another guy, uh, also now doing very well. And this, this woman now is 75, by the way, and she's doing well. And this guy also just turned 75, doing very well. So APOE4 positive, very typical story. Um, there are 75 million Americans who are APOE4 positive. There are about 7 million Americans who are APOE4 homozygous. Now, if you have zero copies of APOE4, your chance during your lifetime of getting Alzheimer's is about 9%. It's not zero, but it's not terribly high. If you have a single copy, it's about 30%. And if you have two copies, it's well over 50%. So most likely you will get it during your lifetime. So our argument is everybody should know this. Everybody should then get on prevention. And we could literally make this a rare disease. However, what we're told is don't check it because there's nothing you can do about it. And I have to say I, I disagree with that. This guy already early in the process had a PET scan, very typical for Alzheimer's disease. It essentially looks like two L's. You have a decreased glucose utilization in your temporal lobe and your parietal lobe, and also in a few other uh, areas, areas uh, such as posterior cingulate. Um, but it's a very clear pattern you see again and again and again. And this guy had actually followed his own decline, had gone and had neuropsych testing 2003, 2007. And as many people do, he'd gone like this and then really fell off the cliff late in the course. Very common problem. So his wife actually brought him to see me December of 2013. He had gone in his California verbal learning test from 84th percentile down to the third percentile. Couldn't remember his lock combination, faces, schedule, very typical story. Uh, difficulty at work. Uh, and interestingly, he had been a guy where he could add columns of numbers really well. So he would look at columns of numbers with his accountants and say, oh yeah, that's about 430,000. They say, wow, that's very quick. He lost that with his Alzheimer's. He got it back and still has it to this day. So interestingly, as with most people, it takes three to six months to start seeing people turning around. You've got to really live the program for a while. Um, Got it, you know, his coworkers knew it, his schedule faces, all those things. But his wife called me and she said, you know, you're missing the most important thing. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, yeah, he's better. She said, but the striking thing was that he had been accelerating in his decline for about 18 months before he started. And she said that just completely stopped when he changed, got onto the program. So he's done very well. Actually, I just uh, talked to him recently, doing very well. So after he'd been on this for two years, we said to him, look, you need to go back and you need to get the neuropsych follow because you've got a very nice, clear uh, demonstration of your decline. How well are you doing? And he's, he was very reluctant to do that. He said, look, I know I'm doing better. I, things are great at work. My wife knows I'm doing better. My coworkers know I'm doing better. When he had gone to the neuropsychologist in the past, he said the guy was really negative. He said, there's nothing you can do about Alzheimer's. So he's so pessimistic. What if he tells me I'm not doing that well? So we finally convinced him, look, you might be able to help other people. So please go back and just, just do your best. So you can see he went back here. And my wife and I were actually driving north from UCLA back to the Bay Area. And we got a call from the neuropsychologist. He said, you've got to come see these numbers. He said, I've been practicing neuropsychology for 30 years. I've never seen anything like this before with a guy with Alzheimer's disease. So you can see here just dramatic improvements. Here is you know, auditory delayed memory from 13th percentile to 79th percentile, reverse digit span from 24th percentile to 74th percentile, et cetera. So he's done extremely well. One more guy here. This is a guy, both parents died with Alzheimer's. 
Um, he's APOE34. He'd already had an amyloid PET that was markedly positive. FDG PET also typical for Alzheimer's. He had reduced hippocampal volume, which again is typically a bad prognostic sign. Um, neuropsych testing showed that he was already well into pre-Alzheimer's MCI. And again, you can look at this guy from a functional medicine standpoint and see why this guy is having problems. So his CRP is 9.9. .9. It should be less than 1.0. So he is on fire. He's got inflammation, systemic inflammation. Homocysteine was 15.1. It shouldn't be more than 6 or 7. So again, he's got poor methylation here. His vitamin D, this guy is a brilliant physician who went to a major university when he was 15 because he was a genius. And you can see this guy's walking around with a very low vitamin D. Uh, and I talked to this guy and I said, you know, you're giving yourself Alzheimer's by walking around like this. And he said, well, you know, if, if he said, if I'm gonna do this protocol, he said, I need a dominatrix. And I said, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> But he's one of these guys where he has a very, uh, you know, he has got a very stressful job. So he would literally go home on Friday after seeing his patients, and he would start, you know, eating massive amounts of ice cream. So you know, he had glucose intolerance at a very high uh, insulin resistance, had low testosterone, as you can see here. So this guy was metabolically a mess. And so I was trying to explain this. This was before we published our first paper. And he had called UCLA to say, if you, had, if you ever have anything like uh, that might be helpful, you know, let me know. I said, well, actually, we're doing something. We're getting some good results. You know, why don't you come by and talk to me? So as I started to explain to him, this, right, this guy's always the smartest guy in the room. So he didn't believe anything I said to him. So I would say, well, you know, this is important. He said, that's not a cure for Alzheimer's. Like, OK, OK. So finally, after a while of this, I said to the guy, look, give me six months. If I can't make you better in six months, then go somewhere else. He said, there is no other place. I said, great, OK. <laughs> well, give me a chance then. So three months into this, his wife called me up, and she said, I can't believe he's so much better. He's seeing his patients again, and is actually now, he's now using his, our, our protocol. So he responded absolutely beautifully, metabolically, cognitively, volumetrically. His neurologist called me and said he's back to normal. So I said to him, could you just go, let's check your hippocampal volume again. And he looked at me and he said, you don't grow new brain. And I said, well, you know, wait a minute. I said, now, there are some studies with exercise alone that have shown small increments in hippocampal volume. So you're, you've done more than that, much more than that, and you're doing great. Let's find out how your hippocampus looks. So finally, reluctantly, he went back in. And you can see his hippocampal volume had gone from 17th percentile to the 75th percentile. And we've seen this in other people now as well. Although we don't always see it, but, we some, but we've seen it in, in several. And so very excited. Interestingly, before we could celebrate, the neuroradiologist writes him a note and says, we've made a mistake. You haven't come back in. And he said, because it's impossible for your hippocampus to do this. And we said, well, wait a minute. You know, let's, let's see. I said, do you have, you have the films? So we literally had to get the films because the neuroradiologist would not believe it. And then we had to take them for a separate reading. They do computer-based readings. And they basically showed the same thing. So this guy also had an increase of 23% in his gray matter volume. And it's a little hard to see here because you literally, what the computer is measuring here is literally this ribbon you can see around here, there, which is thicker over here. So it's hard to see on the films, but it's measured by a computer. OK. So here's a note from a physician. Uh, we've trained now 1,500 physicians from 10 different countries and all over the US. And I have to say, there's nothing better than getting a note from patients or their families or physicians saying things are better. And you can see here, just wanted to share that my Alzheimer patient had his follow-up visit today and is amazingly better. I just got one a couple of weeks ago where the physician cried. The, the, person, the person had come in to see the physician and had gotten so much better that the physician cried. And it just really made my day to see this. So we published this paper last year on 100 patients with documented improvement, all of whom had Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's and well-documented improvement. And this was from 15 different clinics. Um, so we're, people are seeing this everywhere. 
when you understand the actual biochemistry. And so that's the idea. We need to understand how this actually works. And I think you know, the, the electrophysiology that we've been hearing about today is going to be a huge part of this. We need to fix the biochemistry so that we can have the appropriate performance electrophysiologically. So we worked, as I say, we worked on this for 30 years in the lab. How do we go about developing an effective treatment for an incurable disease? Well, what it turns out is when you look at these complex chronic illnesses that we are all dying from today, they have something in common. They are imbalances in signaling. And what's really interesting is that if you have a neurodegenerative disease, you have a mismatch chronically or repeatedly between the, all the supply to that neural subsystem, be it for neuroplasticity in Alzheimer's, or be it for your macula in macular degeneration, or for your motor modulation system in Parkinson's, and you just go right down the list. And I should mention where we've got the, just the first couple of macular degeneration patients who are doing absolutely great based on the same thing. What's the biochemistry driving macular degeneration? So if you have osteoporosis, why do you have osteoporosis? Well, because the cells that are making the bone, which are the osteoblasts, are not keeping up with the osteoclasts. It's a little bit like if you've got people working on your house and you've got two contractors, one does the demolition, one does the building. Imagine that for 20 years, the demolition guys always did a little extra, and the guys who actually did the construction never showed up. What would happen to your house, right? It would just start getting smaller, smaller. That's what osteoporosis is all about. Cancer, same idea. You've got a set of signals in your cells that make more cells. That's normal. And on the other hand, you have a set of signals that turns over the cells. And in fact, if you just count to two seconds, one elephant, two elephant, you have one million of your white blood cells have just committed suicide. And of course, they've been replaced. So. When you have mutations because you smoked or because you got in the sun too much or because you got exposed to, to various chemical carcinogens, et cetera, et cetera, what happens? You get specific somatic mutations in your DNA that change that balance. And unfortunately, when they change it too much and in the wrong direction, you can develop what we call cancer. Well, it turns out that we found in the lab, Alzheimer's is no different. There's a whole set of signals that are synaptoblastic, that are literally allowing your cells to connect with synapses and to keep those synapses. And this is going on all the time, of course. You're actively remembering where your keys are. You're actively forgetting the seventh song that played on the radio on the way to work yesterday. So you have this beautiful dynamic balance in your life. Well, when you stop feeding that system, when you change your hormones, your trophic factors, your nutrients, you've got inflammation going on, you've got toxins you're exposed to, all these things play on this same biochemical pathway. And your brain is literally protecting itself by putting down the amyloid and literally by pulling back. So we can measure these various things so we know if you're more on the synaptoblastic side and the synaptic or the synaptoclastic side. Everybody with Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's is on the synaptoclastic side. So we want to increase all the synaptoblastic signals. We want to decrease all the synaptoclastic signals. And that's what makes people better. You can now blow this up and look at a single synapse, and you have about 500 trillion of these. So as we heard earlier from Gerilyn, yes, you've got this amazing supercomputer. Incredible. So here we are. One, here's one synapse out of the 500 million or so. We can actually look at all the things that are synaptoblastic, the, the biochemistry that makes the synapses and keeps them. And we can also look at the things that are pulling back. And for everybody with Alzheimer's, this too much of this, too little of this. <clears throat> and by the way, these things actually talk to each other. It's interesting. They are, they've been compared to human interactions. You have courtship, you have commitment, you have marriage, and you can have divorce. And they yell at each other sometimes. You literally pull, can pull back and lose these synapses under the wrong situations. Now, we can blow this up further. And so we can look at one molecule that is the quintessence of Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so this is APP, which is in the middle here. So this is the guy in the middle. 
This thing is actually a master switch. Now, when things are good, when you have enough nutrients, when you have enough hormone, when you have enough of your trophic factors like nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor, then this master switch is actually cut in the middle by a molecular scissors that's called alpha secretase, and therefore you get these two things on the left, SAPP alpha and alpha CTF. And those things actually support neurite growth and synapse maintenance. So they're literally telling you times are good. So I always tell people, imagine you're the president of my brain of Stan. Okay, you're the president of my brain of Stan. Things are good. You've got plenty of money in your coffers. There's no runaway inflation. There's no pollution. You're not fighting any wars. What do you do? You build. That's what your brain does. On the other hand, your second term is president of my brain of Stan, and now everything's bad. You've got people coming across the borders attacking your country. You've got rampant pollution, runaway inflation. What do you do? You pull back. You're trying to fight the invaders. Well, that's the second part of this. So when things are bad, you cut the same molecule at three different sites, and you produce four different peptides that are all about pulling back and protecting the brain. SAPP beta, A beta, J cast, and C31. Now, interestingly, A beta is the thing that everyone says, oh, that's Alzheimer's disease. You can see it's a little piece of a much, much bigger story about how your brain works. So the A-beta is, interestingly, an antimicrobial. You're making it to fight the things that are coming to damage your brain. So when you're making that stuff, we know you've got some insults going on. Let's figure out where they, what they are, what's going on. And then other things are downstream, effects on your mitochondria, the plaques themselves, neurite retraction. These are downstream. Now, you can say, like a drug company, OK, let's just make something that prevents one of the cuts. That's been tried, doesn't work. And it's because there are multiple pathways. And I'll show you how that works. So if we take that balance I just showed you, we can shift that very simply in a transgenic mouse just by changing one amino acid in the whole APP. And if you play that, then you'll see that this guy, this is a normal mouse. Boom, he does very, very well. So that's the control mouse. And then if you go to the next one, oh, that's, oh, that's, oh, like, that says control mouse. So that was the one that just played. OK. So here's a guy that has Alzheimer's. So if you play that, you'll see this is, this is a guy where we give him Alzheimer's. And let's, OK, if you start that, you'll see that, yeah, there he goes. So it, it really amazed me. This guy is genetically identical to the last guy, except he's got a gene from a human family with Alzheimer's. Now, less than 5% of Alzheimer's is familial Alzheimer's. So this is not a great model for the run-of-the-mill Alzheimer's, but very good for, for uh, genetic Alzheimer's. And this guy goes around and around. We take him out after 60 seconds so he doesn't drown. Uh, but you can see how bad the memory is for these guys. They don't remember where to swim to this thing. OK, if you go to the next one, this guy is identical to the last guy genetically, except and he's got just as much amyloid in his brain. But we've tilted that balance that I just showed you by making one mutation. So if you look, if you look at this guy, you can see here, he's actually just as smart as the first guy. And when we first tried to get this published, it was back in 2006, people said, it, no, it's, this can't be, because amyloid is everything in Alzheimer's, and that's what was thought at the time. And you can see this guy has just as much amyloid as the last guy, but he's actually doing very well. OK, so the key then is, let's, oops, let's go to the next one here. OK, there we go. So in a mouse, we can make this change simply by changing one amino acid. We wanted to know, well, what does it take in a human to make this change in balance? Well, humans are much more complicated than the mice. And so you can see, in fact, if you look at APP, which is sitting in the middle here, this is the interactome with APP. So these are all these other molecules. So what this thing is doing, this is literally a sensor. It is sensing your estradiol level. It is sensing whether you have ongoing inflammation. It is sensing your hormonal status, your BDNF status, on and on and on. So this thing is literally sensing, should I go the direction of building? Should I go the direction of retracting? So therefore, for a human, we actually have to look at all those different things. OK, so in the last few minutes here, I just want to show you uh, the other piece of this, which is that 
ApoE4, as you know, it's the big, it's the common one, the most important genetic risk factor. Nobody had understood why. Why does ApoE4, why is it associated with Alzheimer's? And so everybody knew it starts with ApoE4, everybody knows it ends with Alzheimer's. Nobody knew what was in the middle. So we started a project about a decade ago to look at this. Now, ApoE is like your butcher. It's a molecule that carries around the fat. So it's the guy that carries the fat. What the heck does that have to do with Alzheimer's disease? And it's an amazing story, as it turned out. And I call this the chimp that killed the rhino. It's about evolution. Because chimps, when we appeared, the ho we hominids appeared from the simians uh, between 5 and 7 million years ago. What happened? Well, of course, God came down, and he touched us with DNA, right? So there's a relatively small number of changes between the simians and the hominids. In fact, we're about 99% genetically identical. And my wife, who actually had worked on this protocol, and she was the one that told me 20 plus years ago, you know, whatever you guys find in the lab, it's gonna have something to do with the basics like what you're eating and drinking and exercising and sleeping. And I said to her, no, 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 no. We're gonna find one fold of one molecule. We're gonna get a drug and everything's gonna be great. Well, of course, I should have listened to my wife 20 years ago. She, she was right. She was absolutely right. So I told her about this, and I said, you know, my DNA is actually more similar to a chimp, a male chimp DNA, than it is to yours. And she said, well, duh. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, you, you like the Three Stooges. The chimp likes the Three Stooges. You know, duh, right? OK. So the bottom line here is that this has to do with whether we're going to get atherosclerosis, how long we're going to live, uh, whether we're going to get Alzheimer's, it's striking. And so we want to know our APOE status because we can actually manipulate the biochemistry to our advantage. So APOE4, which was the original one, the primordial one was APOE4 when we initially descended from the simians. And so it looks like house columns. And that's because of this arginine 61, which wasn't present in the chimp. It was a threonine in the chimp. And the glutamate 255. So that's a positive charge, a negative charge. They interact with each other. On the other hand, just 220,000 years ago, so that's only the last 4% of hominid evolution, the APOE3s appeared. And that's the dominant one now. So I checked my own. I'm at 3.3. That's the kind of the vanilla. That's the most common one. What happened there is cysteine-112 appeared, and now that interacts with arginine-61, and so now glutamate actually swings. That area of APOE3 actually swings free there. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's just been very recently. There's all the time for APOE4, just recently for APOE3, and then even more recently, 80,000 years, for APOE2. And OK, so what we found, to, to take a 10-year story and put it into a few seconds here, is that APOE binds to receptors. That had been known before. What hadn't been known is that when it enters the cell, it interacts with another molecule called RELA, which is part of your inflammatory response. So your inflammatory response is interacting directly with your APOE. And what are they doing? They go into the nucleus of your cell. That had never been appreciated before. And they bind to 1,700 different genes and they turn them down, and they're critical genes. And so it's, what they're doing is they're giving you a more pro-inflammatory response because what happened when we come down to the trees, as Professor Tuck Finch from USC has pointed out, we step on things, we get infected, we go on and on with these things that are actually where you actually have to have a pro-inflammatory response. So that's great for survival when you're eating raw meat and when you're stepping on dung on the savanna. But when you are now trying to live a longer life and trying to avoid Alzheimer's, you don't want to have that. So if you look now at the 1,700 genes, you could not tell a better story for Alzheimer's. You can see why this change in, uh, in your cellular programming. So this guy that is your butcher that's carrying around the fat, APOE, is also your senator making the laws of the land changing your cellular programming. So if you are an APOE4, you are REL-A dominant. You're pro-inflammatory. And by the way, you're going to survive better 
if you're in a third world country with squalid conditions. However, if you're in APOE3, you are not going to survive as well if you've got things like infections, but you're going to do better with longevity and less Alzheimer's and less cardiovascular disease because you have less inflammation. So if you know which one you are, you can actually adjust things to take that into account. So what this means is if we're going to develop the perfect Alzheimer's drug, what does it have to do? Here's what the perfect Alzheimer's drug has to do. This is the problem. We are asking too much of our single drug for Alzheimer's. And I actually think drugs are going to be very important in Alzheimer's disease, but on the backbone of an entire program. That's the way to do this. So this is why I say this is a roof with 36 holes. We need to train a new kind of physician, right? The traditional Chinese physicians, very good with whole body, but they didn't know about DNA or RNA or microRNAs or any of that stuff. On the, on the other hand, modern doctors, they're very good with DNA. They're very good with RNA. But they don't get, just as I showed you in that earlier workup, they don't get that the whole thing has to work together. So we have to train a new kind of doctor, right, that is able to do both, right, that really gets how this all works, but is able to look at the whole system. So the bottom line here is Alzheimer's should actually be a rare disease. We, nobody here should get it if we get the appropriate prevention and early reversal. Later, we, we do see we've had people with MOCA scores of zero who had improvement, but it's harder the farther along. So we want to look at it early on. So what we call Alzheimer's disease is actually a protective response to these different metabolic and toxic changes. There are these six subtypes I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Cognitive decline can be improved, and we see it again and again and again. Um, not surprisingly, the earlier you start it, the better off you are. And the bottom line is we can reduce the global burden of dementia. This is a trillion dollar global problem, and we can reduce this problem. And not only that, take people who are thinking normally and enhance their normal thinking. And as Professor Mike Mersnick from UCSF says, this will result in you know, fewer traffic accidents, uh, fewer plane crashes, and things like that. So there's a lot of work for all of us to do. And, and this is actually from a rabbi, which I think was a really a, a very interesting quote. He says, you're not expected to complete your life's work during your lifetime. Neither are you excused from it. So I think we all have a lot of work to do in our lifetimes and in others' lifetimes from the future. So thanks very much. <laughs>